stage, Pastor Ebenezer. How are you guys doing today? You guys doing well? You guys can sit. You guys can sit. <laughs> uh, my name is Pastor Ebenezer, and I promise I'm no Scrooge. I'm no Scrooge. Uh, good to be here with you guys. I hear that the 9 a.m. service is the spiritual people. This is the spiritual people that come to the 9 a.m. Uh, y'all the disciplined ones. Y'all love the Lord dearly, and you value the presence of God over your sleep. And so I commend y'all uh, for being here at 9 a.m. Yeah, give it a round of applause for yourselves. <laughs> Uh, I want to read a passage real quick before we get into the message. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says this. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Um, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but this is Pastor's Appreciation Month. And in addition to that, today, your pastor celebrates seven years of marriage. And so if you guys can do me a big favor, yeah, give a round of applause. If you can text them and let them know how much you love them, you care about them, how much you, um, yeah, wouldn't be here without them. Cash up them some money, you know, take care of their lunch and dinner today, some coffee. Your pastor, Christina, she She's addicted to coffee. And so uh, get her some Starbucks and let them know how much you care about them. Um, all right, you guys ready to get in the word today? Um, we will be in Nehemiah chapter one. If you have your Bibles, turn to, or if you're on your cell phones, click to Nehemiah chapter one. We're gonna pick it up in verse five. Um, and we should have it up for you um, if you don't have your cell phone or your Bible. Um, we're gonna read it. We'll pray over it and see what the Lord has for us. Is that cool with y'all? Awesome. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey the commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon... I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants, your people, whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and it to the prayer of your servants who delight in re uh, revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Now, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence. We just want to pause and take a moment to acknowledge that you're here. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you illuminate the word of God to us. And so today, Lord, I pray that I get out of the way and that I leave room and we leave room for you to speak in our hearts. Father, we ask today that you help us see you in your splendor and your glory. Father, I pray that the things that we receive, the things that we learn, may it radically transform the way we see you and relate to you. Uh, Father, we ask for you to do what only you can do. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, if you're taking notes, the, the title of the message is Praying Bold, Praying Bold. Uh, but let me give you guys some context to where we're at in Nehemiah chapter one. Uh, uh, Brother Andy set me up really well by talking about Zerubbabel. Uh, Zerubbabel has gone back to Jerusalem and started rebuilding the temple. All right. So they're having church back in Jerusalem. And then Ezra, he's a scholar. He's the one who's an expert in the law. He's the communicator, the teacher. He's gone back as well. And so they've, they've got services running. They've got church going. They've got sermons and they're having a good time. But Nehemiah receives word from his brother, 
He comes into town and he tells his brother, hey, um, church is going amazing. I mean, they're killing it. The worship sounds really good. Uh, Ezra, the sermon series he's in is phenomenal. Uh, but the city walls are torn down. And why is that significant? That's significant because if the walls are not up, there's no security in Jerusalem. If there's no security in Jerusalem, guess what? Nobody wants to do business in Jerusalem because anybody can come and loot businesses and steal whatever they can. In fact, uh, this is their security system. So if you're, at, if you're living in Jerusalem, anybody can come in the middle of the night and take all of your belongings. And so Nehemiah hears this and his heart is broken. His heart is broken not over where their church is at, but where the community is at. He has a heart and a burden for the city of Jerusalem. He says, no, 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 no. Uh, we need to rebuild the wall because we need to get barbershops back and running. I, I don't know about you. In 2020, barbershops were not considered essential businesses. And I took offense to that. <laughs> uh, barbershop, th thank you. You know what I'm saying? We need barbershops. Uh, Nehemiah says, we need apartment buildings and houses. We need safety for the people in Jerusalem. He says, we need grocery stores. We need restaurants. We need Starbucks, right? We need the city to be fortified so the surrounding enemies cannot enter easily. Nehemiah is not a church planter. Nehemiah has a heart for the people of God, but he wants to serve their physical needs because Nehemiah knows that a gospel that addresses the heart but not the body is incomplete. I don't know if you guys know this, but soul literally means the essence of who you are. The, the, the word is nephosh, mind, soul, and body, body. The, Jesus even understood this in the New Testament. You guys remember the Sermon on the Mount? He, he's giving them instructions for how to live in relation to one another. I remember when he uh, gives a, the, the, I'm sorry, um, the 5,000, he feeds the 5,000. He sees that they're hungry. Their soul is receiving the word of God. Their spirit is receiving. But he's like, yo, they haven't eaten. Their, their body needs energy. So what does he do? He breaks the bread and he feeds the multitudes. Why? Because their body matters just as much as their soul. And Nehemiah understands that. I need to care not just for their spirit and their soul. Zerubbabel Bell and Israel got that on lock. I care about their body. And so I need to rebuild this wall. But before he has any plan, before he has any favor, the Bible tells us that for four months he prays. Um, I don't know how y'all do in the DMV, but in Minnesota, we tell people we have a conference. People are showing up. We tell people we're having a worship night. They show up. And then we say, we've got a prayer night. And it's just the leadership team that comes and it's because they have to come, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Nobody likes to pray. But here it is, Nehemiah for four months begs the Lord for wisdom, begs the Lord for favor, begs the Lord for strength, begs the Lord for a plan. And we get an opportunity to see what his prayer is entailed. In verse five, he says, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Brother Andy was talking, he preached my first point. The way Nehemiah starts off his prayer is by acknowledging who his God is. He doesn't start with the problem. He starts with his God. In fact, if you're taking notes, that's the first point. Start with God. I love this because every time I go into prayer, I start with the problem. Lord, look at my GPA. <laughs> Any students in the room? I'm at 1038, so that, that'll land on them a little bit better. Uh, God, look at my bank account. <laughs> my money's looking funny, right? Uh, God, look at my relationship status. God, look at my family. God, look at this illness. We, we approach God with the problem and we complain, Lord, what are you doing about this? Do you not see that I'm struggling? Do you not see that I'm hurting? Do you not see that I've got an obstacle in my way? But Nehemiah doesn't start with the problem. Nehemiah starts with his God, the awesome one the mighty one, the God of covenant. This is my God. He needs the right perspective because if you start with God, you can have faith for the problem. See, a lot of us, we struggle in our prayer because the whole prayer is about our problem. 
God, do this. God, do that. God, what's wrong with this? God, fix my spouse. God, fix my family. God, fix my bank account. God, fix my professor. Help him give me an A, right? Like Nehemiah doesn't start with all the obstacles that he will face. He starts with his God, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant. A man of God says it like this, Nehemiah's prayer is mounted immediately to heaven where the perspective will be right. And it reflects the character of God, not only for its encouraging aspects of love, but first of all, for the majesty which puts man, whether friend or foe, in his place. I like that. He starts with God because when you start with God, you can put anybody else in their proper place. You see, Nehemiah is gonna have to ask the king of Persia to give him the freedom to go back and help rebuild the temple. See, the king of Persia, he's a big deal. But Nehemiah knows that his God is a bigger deal than the king of Persia. So instead of focusing on how difficult this is gonna be, he reminds himself who his God is. He remembers God's kindness before he remembers their sin. He remembers God's faithfulness before his inadequacy. Nehemiah starts off his prayer by declaring the goodness of God and his covenant. And then in verse six, it says, let your be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer servant is praying before you day and night for your servant, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Now, as I'm reading verse six and seven, I'm a little confused and rubbed the wrong way. Uh, Nehemiah is confessing sin. But if you guys are familiar with Nehemiah's story, Nehemiah is not responsible for the predicament that he finds themselves in. Nehemiah is born into captivity. What does that mean? He's not the reason why they're a slave. <laughs> Nehemiah has no part to play in the problem. Nehemiah is a slave in Persia because of Jeroboam and Rehoboam's sin and Solomon's sin. But here Nehemiah, is, uh, in his prayer, he's acknowledging, he's confessing that he has failed as well, that he has fallen short as well. I love this because before he tries to bring a solution, he confesses how he's played a part in the problem. Uh, we don't like that in the church. Uh, people always ask me, Pastor, how do you know who to put in position? Leaders, what, what leaders to put in position? I said, it's very easy. I pay attention to language. When people come up to me and say, Pastor, I love this church. This is amazing. Parazim is great. I love it. Um, I, just, I just feel like y'all a little bit clicky at Parazim Church, and I feel like you guys should do something about that. When I hear y'all and you, I know immediately they're not ready for leadership. But when somebody comes up to me and says, hey, Pastor, I just noticed where we are clicky, and, and we, we can make people feel excluded, I'm like, okay, tell me more. I'm just thinking maybe we should do X, Y, Z. That person is ready for leadership. Why? Because they not only see the problem, but they see how they've contributed to the problem. Nehemiah might have not been the reason why they're in exile, but Nehemiah knows, man, I've got some apathy in my heart. Nehemiah knows I could have been praying way more than I've been praying. Nehemiah knows, man, I know I'm not the reason why we're here, but maybe, maybe I should have sought the Lord out a little bit better in all of this. Nehemiah understands his part in the problem. And so when he's asking God for help, he confesses his sin because he knows that God sees the heart and Nehemiah is not where he should be. Ownership breeds responsibility. We live in a day and age where we are incredibly gifted at pointing out other people's sins. Have you guys know anybody on Twitter? No? All right. Maybe the, <laughs> Twitter is, 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 is a great place. Uh, but Twitter, just people pointing at other people, people calling out other people, people talking about how others have failed short. Man, if only we had this president, our country would be in a different position. 
If only I had this kind of professor, this class would have been more enjoyable. If only these people saw things this way, then my situation would have looked different. But Nehemiah doesn't stress out on how others drop the ball. Nehemiah says, no, 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 I don't have time to look at your sin. Where have I missed it? Nehemiah's prayer isn't, Lord, help them see their sin. He says, Lord, forgive us for our sin. He not only starts with God, but he acknowledges where he's fallen short. Then in verse eight, it goes on to say, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at, the, uh, are at the furthest horizon, I will gather for them there and bring them to a place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. You know what I love about what Nehemiah does in his prayer? In verses eight through 10, we see that Nehemiah rehearses and recalls the promises of God. Translation, Nehemiah's prayer is not wishful thinking. You know how a lot of us pray sometimes? Lord, if it's your will, it would be nice. I would really appreciate. God, like I, I know you're really busy up there. I mean, some of us were like, okay, let me, let me come to church for four weeks straight. Let me, let, me, let me make sure me and God are good and then I can make my request made known to God. Let me make sure me and him are good. No, no, Nehemiah doesn't pray with some insecurity. Nehemiah doesn't wishfully uh, think that things can happen. No, Nehemiah says, hold up, wait a minute. I know the word of God and I know God's promises. I know God's heart. I know God's will. I know God's ways. I know what God desires for us. And so instead of praying wishfully, what does he do? He anchors his prayer in the promises of God. What would it, what would you, if you, would you, would you pray more if you knew that God would answer 10 out of your 10 prayers? If I were to say, I guarantee you every single prayer request you pray, the Lord would answer, would you pray more? I know I would. How do we know that God will answer our prayers? When we align ourselves with the will of God, when we align ourselves with the promises of God, when we anchor our prayers and who God's promises, and what God's promises are and who God is, then we see some results. Nehemiah understands God's heart. And because he understands God's heart, he can pray boldly. He can pray boldly. I want to give a, a quick story. One of my favorite pastors of all time, Dr. Tony Evans, um, pastors out of Dallas, Texas. He tells this story about this one time where him and his church and his team decided to put on this huge event outside. It's like the revival meeting. Uh, they were expecting thousands of people to attend to this, this uh, event, this conference. And so they were getting ready. I mean, they put money into it. I mean, they got volunteers. They've got an amazing band. They've got all the speakers lined up. They got their prayer warriors. Like, this is it. Um, and then the day of the event comes and the weather forecast says that it's gonna rain. It's getting cloudy and they're very scared. Okay, is this gonna turn people away? Should we cancel the event? Have you ever been there where you organize something and the weather is not in your favor, right? Maybe if the event was indoors, it would have been a problem, but this is an outdoor event. This is an outdoor experience. And so they're trying to figure out what they should do. And so Dr. Tony Evans says, you know what? Uh, let's call all the leaders together and let's pray. Let's pray. So they gather all the leaders together and they start praying. And here's what ends up happening. Um, everybody prays safe prayers. They, they, they say things like, Lord, if it's your will, please stop the rain. Lord, if you would just be so kind to stop the rain, that would be nice. Lord, we trust you. With the event, without the event, we know what you're doing. These are the prayers, these safe prayers. And then there's this young lady. It's her turn to pray. And she gets a little audacious with her prayer. She says, Lord, <laughs> You told us to make disciples of all nations. Lord, you told us to serve our neighbor. 
Lord, you told us to use our gifts to edify the body. So Lord, right now, we command you to stop the rain. And Dr. Tony Evans says, as soon as she says, we command you, he kind of moved a little away just in case the lightning strikes. Like, I'm not trying to get hit by lightning, right? Like, this is audacious. How dare you talk to God like that? But this young lady knew something everybody else didn't. She knew the will of God. You see, they weren't putting an event together just to put an event together. They didn't raise money just to raise money. They gathered, they got together because they wanted to see souls. They wanted to see revival. They wanted to see God lifted high. They wanted to see salvation. And so she anchored her request in the promises of God. And then after the prayer, she told the team, we're putting this event on. And I mean, Dr. Tony, what, are you gonna, what is he gonna say, no? <laughs> Pastor, where's your faith, right? So he's like, uh... <laughs> Yeah, let's, let's do the event. I mean, if it rains, we'll just shut it down and let's, let's have at it. Let's try this out. And so they get up on stage and um, the clouds start to form and the clouds start coming in. And the clouds are coming from their backside. And so everybody backstage is looking up and they're like, well, God, what you gonna do about this one, right? Well, what are you gonna do here? And what happens is it's so fascinating. The, the, the clouds come closer, come closer, come closer. And as soon as it's over the stage, the clouds split. And it rains on their right side and their left side. Nowhere near where the service is happening. And everybody backstage, all the leaders are literally looking up and watching the clouds move. To the right, to the left, it's raining, just not where they're at. And then as soon as the clouds pass, everybody else, the clouds come back, meet, rains and then continues to move. And Dr. Tony Evans shares the story about how his faith needed to grow and how his prayers needed to be anchored in the promises of God. See, Nehemiah is bold in his prayer, not because it's gonna be easy. Nehemiah is bold in his prayer, not because he knows that things will just happen the way he wants it to happen. Nehemiah knows that obstacles are coming his way. Nehemiah knows he needs volunteers and workers. Nehemiah understands that this is not an easy task, but here's the truth of it all. Nehemiah knows that God wants his people to come back. He says, if, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nation. But, verse 9, if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are the, at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. So Nehemiah knows that this is God's heart. Even if we're exiled, even if we're far apart, even if we go to the furthest horizon, if we confess, if we say we're sorry, God, he will hear our prayer. He will return us back to the place that he has for us. Nehemiah's prayer is not wishful thinking. He knows God's going to do it. By the way, if, if you want a book on leadership, read Nehemiah, because the book of Nehemiah is one of my favorite books. It's amazing what we see. It's just God coming, up, coming through for them time and time and time again. And I, I want to share something with you guys. If you're in here and you're wondering how to pray, I, I want to I I show you a couple of ways to pray. If you're in here right now and you're saying, Lord, I've got a need, but I don't know if you'll provide. Philippians 4.19 says, and my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Think about that for a second. If you pray according to Philippians 4.19, the Lord will hear your prayer and answer you, not because he just does it, but because you have anchored your request to the character of God, to the heart of God, to the will of God. If you're in this room and you're saying, Lord, I need healing, emotional, physical, spiritual, whatever it is, relational, James 5, 14 to 15 tells us, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them, anoint them with oil and in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up if they have sinned and they will be forgiven. This is a promise of God. And last I checked, God keeps his promises. He's not like man who breaks his promises. Is, is there anybody in here who needs peace, who has 
restless nights, who can't fall asleep, who just wakes up and bombarded by worry, bombarded by concern, bombarded by things that are going wrong. Philippians 4 verses 6 through 7 says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. You can take this to the bank. I've got a couple of observations and we'll be done for today. He says, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. What I love about Nehemiah's prayer is he not only anchors it in the promises of God, he anchors it in the character of God. Nehemiah knows that God is moved by God. Say that again. God is not moved by my church attendance. God is not moved by my prayer life. God is not moved by my disciplines. God is moved by God. In the prayer, Nehemiah acknowledges that they're a sinner. In fact, not a lot of people are actually praying this prayer of repentance, only a few people. But yet and still, Nehemiah understands God's heart. It's kind, it's generous, it's merciful. And he knows that God only needs to be reminded of who God is to move on our behalf. So if you're here today and you feel far from God, if you feel like you're too messed up to pray and, to, and for God to hear you and answer you, I want you to know something. Your performance has nothing to do on God listening and responding to your prayer. God is not moved by the eloquence of your prayer. God is not moved by the, the, the how loud you pray. I mean, I grew up in Ethiopian church, man. I grew up hearing loud prayers. And I'm, I'm an introvert, I'm shy, I don't pray loud. I'm like, God, I don't know if you're hearing me because I'm over here whispering. <laughs> God is not moved by how loud or how soft I pray. God is moved by God, by your name. Lord, this is your glory. He goes on in verse 10 to say, they are your servants, your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Not once in his prayer does he talk about them. Nehemiah is not interested in who they are because he knows they're sinners. He knows they will fall short. He knows they don't got it. But who does? God. So let me remind God who God is. Let me remind my soul who God is. In order for this prayer to be bold, I've got to anchor myself in the promises of God and remind myself who my God is. My God saved us from Egypt. We were slaves. We were hopeless. For 400 years, we had no hope. We were stuck in our ways, but God who was rich in love, rich in mercy, remembered his promise to Abraham and one day said, Moses, I need you to go and set my people free. He reminds God, God, we are yours, aren't we? I know we sin, I know we've messed up, I know we've fallen short, I know we're not the best sometimes, I know we're hard to love, but you don't love us because of who we are, you love us because of who you are. We are yours. You redeemed us by your strength. We had nothing to do with our salvation. We had nothing to do with our freedom. It was because of your great love. So Lord, do it one more time. Do it once more. Save us from Persia. Bring us back to Jerusalem and keep us. Keep us. Lord, let your ears be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. The last point, God grants success. Nehemiah doesn't put his hope in the king of Persia. Nehemiah doesn't put his hope in his strategy. Nehemiah doesn't put hope in his expertise, in his resume. He says, if we're gonna get success, it's gonna come from you, Lord. Lord, I, I don't got it. You know, I, young people, we need to hear that. You know, when we first planted the church in Minnesota, man, we thought we were gonna change the world. And I'm learning, I can't even change myself. God, if, if we're gonna see revival in Minneapolis, if we're gonna see revival in the DMV, you got to show up. Education won't do it. Money won't do it. Power won't do it. 
God will do it. So God, give us favor. Give us success. Save us according to your great name. Our prayers don't have to be wishful thinking. Our prayers don't have to be random. Our prayers can be confident. Our prayers can be bold because we have a God who doesn't just hear us, but responds to us. But this is why we have to anchor ourselves in the word of God. Last observation, I'm done. Um, Nehemiah, it's one thing to know the promises of God. It's another thing to trust the promises of God. So today we can leave here believing that God is great. We, we can hear a sermon and hear, oh, God is faithful. You, you, we can be in here and we can, we can be reminded that God is good, that God is strong. But how many of you guys know it takes another muscle of faith to not just know that, but put that into work? trust in that, to actually get on your knees and say, Lord, okay, I heard you're faithful. I heard you're great. I heard you've got strength, but help me have faith in my situation. Lord, let me believe that your character is not just good for my neighbor, but it's good for me. That your character is not just good for Nehemiah and his generation, but it's good for me and my generation. God, that your character is not just sufficient for the Minneapolis, your character is sufficient for the DMV. Lord, help me believe that you are who you say you are in my situation. It's one thing to know his promises. It's another thing to trust his promises. And we can go to the bank with his promises because he's not a man who shall lie. If you're in here and 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 you're wondering, is, is Jesus worthy? I just, I just wanna let you know he is. He is the best of the best, cream of the crop. <laughs> There's no one like our God. Our God is faithful. Time is, I say, I've been a Christian now for almost 20 years and I've got this track record. I, I can look back and see how God comes through. And if you're in here and, and you're wondering if, if God is good, if God is sufficient, I, I, I urge you to put your faith in him and see for yourself. Uh, I, I'm a foodie, and so I love sharing with people different food spots. And so I just, if it's good to me, it's got to be good to you. I get offended if you don't like the things I like, right? But here's the thing. We, we typically share what we enjoy, right? And so tonight, today, this morning, I want to share what I enjoy. I, I want to share with you the good news of the gospel because it changed my life. And it's this, that it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you did this morning or last night. God is not moved or intimidated by our sin. God is moved by himself. And God's got a lot of love. God's got a lot of grace. In fact, my Bible says he's rich in kindness. And he's after you and he's after me. And so if you're in here and you want a piece of that God, not just for your salvation, but for your situation, uh, we, we wanna invite you to pray with us. And so if, if you can all just bow your heads and close your eyes, and if you're in here and you're saying, man, I wanna follow this God who can save my heart, who can save my soul, but also can help me in any season that I find myself in, just feel free to lift your hands up and we'll all pray together. But if you're in here and you wanna pray that prayer, just lift your hands up. The Lord sees you, the Lord will hear you. Let's pray. Lord, you guys can repeat after me. Father, we thank you that you see me. Lord, we thank you that you are good. Father, we ask that you give us a revelation of your love. Father, help us get our eyes off of ourselves and fixed on you. Father, we ask that you show yourself to be faithful and true in our life. Father, we give you our heart. We give you our soul. We give you our life. Do as you please. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.